Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you from wherever in the world you might be hailing from this morning or this afternoon. We are with some Cape Buffalo all the way up in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. It is a warm day, it is about 26 degrees Celsius, so that's about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And what would you do if it was hot? You would wallow in the mud to keep yourself nice and cool. Please welcome to Safari Live. My name, <laughs> my name is Steve Falconbridge and I'm joined by Archie on camera. Please feel free to send through your comments and questions on at Safari Live on Twitter or follow us on the YouTube stream. Please let us know what you'd like to see this afternoon and any interest, any comments, any questions, feel free. We are going to go towards the lions. We saw part of the marsh breakaways this morning. We're going to go into that area hopefully not get stuck and see if we can find if they've done anything interesting since their potential warthog this morning. I think I'm going to be joined by Jamie as well this afternoon which is wonderful stuff and then later on this afternoon we'll be going down to sunny South Africa with a few of my friends there who will be giving us some interesting information from that side. So we're going to continue on. We've got some buffalo but they are always here. What a wonderful way to start the afternoon. A little bit bumpy, hold on Archie. We've just come down the escarpment. It is a lovely day. There's a lot of cloud build up and I wonder if we're going to get another thunderstorm. It's a lot warmer than it was yesterday. And yesterday we got an amazing thunderstorm from the escarpment. So let's hope we don't get too wet. But if we do, our skin is waterproof. It's all good, all good. Oh, look at that. This is the Maasai Mara. So folks, we're going to continue on in our way. And while we do so, we're going to go to Miss Jamie Patterson, who is going to say good, e good afternoon. Hey, very good afternoon to all of you and welcome on our sunset safari. Now, as Steve has already told you, my name is Jamie, but he hasn't told you that Adrian is on camera with me. And this afternoon we are on the opposite side of the Mara River to where Steve is. And the reason I'm peering intently into the distance is I am looking for Malaika, the female cheetah with her two cubs. This is where I had her two afternoons ago and I left her yesterday morning just over there we actually had the most amazing time with her we really did Adrian and I were with her all night and she was really really hungry she caught an impala in the dark at around about nine o'clock at night unfortunately we didn't have any signal so we couldn't do an unscheduled broadcast but we had the most probably the most phenomenal cheetah hyena interaction I've ever seen in my entire time working out here. A hyena came in as she had the impala and went to grab it. She hadn't even killed the impala yet, poor thing. And one of her boys had gone chasing further on. I don't think he'd realized that she'd managed to catch anything. And she actually full on attacked or tried to attack the hyena and whacked it with her paw. Hyena did not even blink. Picked up the, the impala and ran off with it and ran into a clump of bushes very similar to this. And poor Malaika harassed this hyena. I never thought I'd ever use that word when referring to a hyena. It was in something like that. Um, she actually harassed the hyena for about an hour and a half with her two boys, trying to get that kill back. Shame. Unfortunately, by the time she managed to goad the hyena out into the open, he'd finished about half of it and he just picked it up and ran with it. And there was nothing she could do. But then he'd drag it and he'd take it into the water and Malaika would stand there looking at him and then he'd drag it into the next puddle and she'd stand there looking at him. So I'm hoping to find her because she then didn't have a meal for the rest of the night and nothing that morning. We'll get a warthog while I'm chatting about our plans for this afternoon. My vehicle's also developed a strange tendency not to turn off even when I turn the key. So if you hear my engine continues to run, that is why. Here's a little warthog. Definitely not something Malaika would want to take on. I don't think a big adult warthog would some, be something that might even make the five males think twice. 
And that, of course, is Brent's plan. He's going to go and search for the five boys. Ah, now Wendy says that there goes Pumba. Wendy, you know, of course, that biologically speaking, uh, even if we take into account this sort of the gentle animating that is usually around the the differences, physical differences in male and female animals, but anatomically, Pumba was a girl, and the reason Pumba was a girl. The reason that Pumba was a girl was because, of course, Pumba only had two warts and not four. Okay, we're going to send you across to Brent to see where he is and whether he's had any luck in making progress towards those five boys. Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to this magnificent Maasai Mara. Uh, it's almost as magnificent as my new shirt, all the way from the Congo. Uh, my name is Brent Yersmith. I have the one, the only Batman on camera. And uh, as we predicted this morning, I said I thought the musketeers had dacked it across this way and hadn't gone over there where everyone was looking for them. And I was right. So I'm heading towards them now. And that's not something you see every day. We've had a beautiful view of a male Cory Buster this morning striding through the golden light. But now we have one deciding it's way too hot to be looking for hohos and things out in the hot sun and has decided to have a snooze under a Balanites tree. Now remember if you have any questions about Cory Bustards, Cheetahs, Lions, Leopards, the Mara or the Greater Kruger, please feel free to send them in and you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or on the YouTube feed or on any of the feeds you might be watching on. So there we go. Hello Cory Bustard. Nice big male. Nate says, what a magnificent looking bird indeed, Nate. They are absolutely glorious. And uh, weighing in at about 12.5 kgs, so what's that? Over 25 pounds makes a male Cory Bustard the world's heaviest flying bird. Now I'm going to keep flying to find the five boys and see if they've had a snack since I last saw them. Hopefully they're looking a little bit peckish and might be on the hunt this afternoon. If they're not, however, we do know where three very hungry lady lions are. Uh, we had them hunting this morning. They were unsuccessful, so maybe they'll hunt again this afternoon. They were just down here. So lots of prospects in the eastern side of the Mara this afternoon, and I'm very excited to take you on this adventure. Okay, while I dash off to the east, uh, let's dash due west to where Steve is in the Mara Triangle. Thanks Brent. Jamie and uh, Brent have been away for a little while. On the other side of the river there doing their thing. I think Jamie's been out of camp for three days now. Shame. Lovely though to be out and spending time out there with Cheetah. And Brent I think joined her the following day. He came back from the Congo. So we are just cruising along here. It is still quite warm. So myself and Archer contemplating whether the Marsh Pride, Breakaway Marsh Pride is actually going to be doing anything of interest. So we're going to do a big loop around the marsh. We're going to pick up on some birds, see what else we can find that's of interest. I have no doubt there's going to be plenty to talk about. It is just wonderful having you with us out in the Mara Triangle to explore. Anna, you would like to see some jackal? We will do our best to see some jackal. Um, I know in the marsh this morning it seemed like there were a lot of hyena activity, lots of warthog activity. I wonder if it's a jackal area. I'm sure we'll make a plan. I believe there might be... Yeah, let's see what we can do for you. I'm still learning the ropes with regards to, to where animals are. And uh, yeah, but I'll do my best. I would like to find you some jackal and hopefully doing something. I know Taylor did tell me there's a jackal den site somewhere. Maybe I'll get hold of her and find out where that is. Or maybe Archie knows where that is. Arch? No? He's shaking his head. If Taylor's listening, I'm sure she'll message me shortly. Jackal would be wonderful. Oh, 
Oh, Tom. Tom asked to have a favorite part in the Mara so far. It's difficult to say, Tom. I'm quite enjoying the kitchen. There are lots of nice food there. No, I'm only joking. I am enjoying the kitchen though, but so far it's been so dynamic. This is my physically my third drive. I've been with Jamie once and it's going to be my second time going into the marsh. I do enjoy this area. I did not enjoy the one road we were on this morning. I can ask Archie. I was giving him a lot of trouble afterwards because I didn't quite enjoy the, the feeling of nearly getting stuck. But going up on the river yesterday where we parked and watched those hippos play, I can just imagine the multitudes of wildebeest crossing there in the next four or five months. Um, but just this entire area is so diverse, so dynamic. So talking about Warthog, as I was before, Jamie, who we haven't seen in four days. I wonder how you're doing, Jamie. We're going to go across to her and find out what else she's up to. I'm sitting watching tiny little piglets. Oh, no, don't panic, little piglets. They were being so well behaved a second ago. We've got some very, very young warthogs. So we started by a discussion about Pumba the warthog in The Lion King. And there's some tiny little Pumbas for everyone to enjoy. Baby warthogs are utterly adorable. Most of them are past that initial really, really cute phase. Most of the pigs were giving birth around about November last year and they were just this place was overrun with uh, tiny miniature warthogs Most of them have got to the point where they're almost ready to start growing their tusks But every now and again, of course you get late births And this looks like a litter of late little ones So sweet Okay, right, so we're done looking at the warties. Hold on a sec. Let's try for another view now, Katie, while we try for another perspective on our pigs, who have gone where exactly? I've lost them completely. Katie's wondering if they're related to wild boars. Yes, they are. Um, they are distantly. Where are they? There they are. I was looking in the wrong direction completely. Um, Katie? They are related to wild boars, but in the, in the sense that they are in the pig family. So it's a distant relation. We also get something called a bush pig, which is more closely related. Where'd they go? Did they run over the ridge? No, there they are. They're right there. There they are. They're hiding by the gardenia. Um, they are bush pigs, or forest hogs, or any of those species that we find in often in the forested areas, but in the crew that lives on Juma, there are bush pigs in South Africa as well, they're just nocturnal. Now bush pigs would be more closely related, they're a lot shaggier in terms of their fur, but uh, warthogs are distantly related, they do belong to the pig family. Where the little piggies gone? There's one little straggler there on the right. Chatwa says piglets, oh that's so cute. I, well, I mean, I don't quite know how to add to that, except to say, yes, they are, aren't they? They are very, very sweet. Little miniature adults. I'm busy keeping my eyes peeled at the same time while we're watching them, wondering if I'm going to see a cheetah walking in the background. I hope she's here somewhere. Ah, Lux, a, a rhetorical question, perhaps, is there anything funnier than a warthog running? Not many things. Um, there's been certain comedy shows that I have watched that I admit have had me guffawing. Um, but absolutely, it is intrinsically comic watching a warthog run away, especially little piglets. The way that their legs work furiously and the tails up in the air, galloping after each other. Yes, I, I do agree. Watching warthogs run is highly entertaining. Less so when they're running from a predator, of course. Then it's not so fun. It's when they're doing this little high trot that they are terribly sweet looking. Another peaceful Mara afternoon. I've come to know the side of the... between double crossing in the Talek River very well. 
while following Malaika. Oh, down into a hole, I think. Quite possibly. I wonder if there's a mud wallow. It's very warm. I was going to say it's boiling, but it's not. Not certainly by the standards on Juma, where, of course, the temperatures get much, much higher. It is warm today, though, and the sun is blazing. And the wind is starting to blow. I don't know. I think there might be a storm in the air. Oh, Dala, that's something I must try and remember what the most recent research said about the different breeds of pigs. Oh, that breed is the wrong word. Um, Dala's wondering about whether there are any different species of warthog, essentially. And if I remember, there are subspecies, but no, there's no different species species. So, of course, the distinction between subspecies and um, and and actual species is always a tricky one, but there are different subspecies, and the warthogs that we see would be a different subspecies to the ones that they see in South Africa. As to what they categorize or what they look for, what characteristics they look look at in order to determine exactly what makes a subspecies, they do look at the DNA, if DNA analysis has been done, something that they've done with giraffe, look at when the subspecies split from each other, how far back, whether there's any breeding between them. It's a complicated process and one that biologists tend to disagree on. And then someone will decide, no, there's seven subspecies of giraffe, and then of course that will get rewritten, and now there's four species of giraffe and subspecies within that, and it all gets terribly confusing. But yes, there are different subspecies. There's not much physical difference when you look at them, though. I generally find, personally, just from pure observation, that the tusks of the warthog and the mara tend to be larger than those that we see in South Africa. That's a personal observation. You do get some really big pigs out here. In fact, I think physically, if I had to guess, I'd say that on average they look as though they are bigger. They look as though they weigh more. Whether that is borne out by the actual facts, I'm not sure. We have a tendency, I think, for all of us to say everything looks bigger in the Mara. I don't know if it's actually true, though. Okay, on with the search. In this vast open space, somebody point to a direction and tell me where Malaika is. Because that's basically how we're going to search for her. We just point in a direction. I'm going to go that way. And then just work my way around, I think. Probably the only approach to follow. Okay, we're going to drive along off in search of Malaika. Let's go and rejoin Steve as he drives, but on the other side of the Mara. Thank you very much, Jamie. Yes, indeed, you with your warthog. Question I have for the viewers out there. What do warthogs need out here to survive? Interesting. We talk about habitat. Obviously, they need grass, yeah? Lots of grass around. Lots of grass. And then water. What's the third thing warthogs need to survive? I'd love to have your comments through on hashtag Safari Live. Warthogs, what do they need to survive? See if any of you can figure it out. It's not very tricky, but I'm sure you all know the answer. Mia would like to know what kind of grass this is. Let me stop, because talking about, I grabbed a grass here. I don't know if Ash can get that on the bonnet. There we go. Beautiful. This is called red oat grass or common oat grass up here and in South Africa we call it red grass and it is a very very palatable grass. It's highly highly nutritious. We talk about palatability folks. Sorry Archie, I'm trying to keep it still. It is in the wind. We talk about nutrition and palatability. Does everybody understand what palatability is? Palatability is the ability of the grass to be digested. Just because there's a lot of it doesn't mean it's digestible. So what you look at in a grass is the amount of leaves it produces and how much fibers or chemicals are in the grass. And this grass out of 10 would be a forage score of 10. So there's lots of nutrients. I mean, if you just 
pan over the, the front there. It's not, not just oat grass here, but this is one of the major grasses we find in the area. The amount of leaf that there is, which is what makes it a very, very good grass. Ooh, there's another one there. Messy head. There's a second grass here that a lot of people get confused with. See if Arch can get in on that. There we go, look at that messy head. Some people think about that and think it's it's uh, the same as this, but it's actually one of the type, types of turpentine grasses. And that one, which has also got a lot of leaf, has got a huge amount of chemicals in it. And when we talk about uh, palatability, that one's got a very low palatability because the chemicals are not easily digested. You need to have a very strong digestive system to break down chemicals. And the, 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 the name turpentine grass, I think that's turpentine grass. It looks very similar to the turpentine grass we have in South Africa. There's a lot of fiber, first of all. Uh, turpentine grass is also used for thatch. So if you've ever had a thatch roof, those, those straw things they have on the roof is very, very strong. Lots of cellulose, so it's very difficult to digest. So if you've got a lot of cellulose, a lot of chemicals, not ideal. But if you've got a lot of leaf and it's very tasty, lots of nutrients, 10 out of 10. Okay, and this area is full of grass. I've actually got a, let me find your little factoid that I, I picked up in the books today. Let me try to work it out for you, see if this is going to be of interest. And it's got to do with the grasses that we find in the area and the, the nutrients of it. Now, I know this, this fact relates to the productivity of the savanna area here. Specifically, the facts are the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. And what's important to understand is that the amount of soil and nutrients in the soil here gives rise to huge amounts of grasses for these wildebeest and for the zebra that come through. But how can you work it out? Okay, so each square yard of grass produces two pounds of edible grass every month, which works out to be 2,850 uh, 2, tons per square mile. That is a huge amount of grass, and if it's all palatable and nutrient-rich, it just supports just a huge portion of animals. And if you've watched the documentaries of the migration, you've seen the 1,300, 1,500 wildebeest, the 600,000 zebra coming through. They are all feeding on, yeah, you got it, grass. So that's what makes these areas so palatable, and it all had to do with the creation of the Great Rift Valley and the, the pushing up of, of lava and all that very nutrient-rich soil all over these areas here, and that's what makes this place such a hot spot for large herbivores. So I hope that answers your question. I haven't heard any comments in my ear about what's the third thing warthogs need to survive out here. You all know the answer. We're still carrying on. Let's, let's hear the comments there, Faith. Ah, Debbie from Vancouver, Sierra and Debbie, you all say they need a safe place to sleep. So what is that? What's a safe place to sleep? Under the bush, in a tree? Do warthogs climb trees? Hey, Rebecca. Rebecca and Renoli, they need the termite mounds, the holes in the ground. Not just for them sleeping, but for their babies, reproduction. Well done, well done. So that's what's important when we talk about habitat. It's not just the food, it's not just the water, it's also breeding sites. Eh? Breeding sites, and that's very relevant to all sorts of animals. There can be plenty of things around, but if they don't have the breeding, there's no proliferation of the species. So I hope you enjoyed a little discussion on grasses there and thanks for the warthog trivia. We're going to go over to Jamie who's on the other side of the river still and I think she has some wonderful feathered friends of mine. I have three wonderful feathered, fre fe feathered friends, fre feathered friends, goodness gracious. In the case here two adult crowned lapwings and then their little one. This is where we spent the night with Malaika two nights ago. So I was where we started with her, this is where we sort of ended up for the morning rehearsal. And don't worry, for those of you who were concerned, because of course you couldn't watch it, um, you didn't miss much. Malaika was so bored she slept all the way through it. Twice. <laughs> but this does explain the amount of noise that was around us throughout the evening. Two very, very upset parental lapwings 
because they have a little one who's now vanished behind the bushes somewhere. Oh no, wait, there it is. It's just to the right of the rock. Here we go. I've got a little one who is now old enough to look sort of like a crowned lapwing. They're the tiny babies, the just hatched babies, are little balls of fluff and utterly adorable. But the the adults, of course, are the, these smooth, smoothly plumaged specimens. The crowned lapwings hatch precocial, so they're fully developed, but they're still very fluffy. And this one has retained its fluffiness, but starting to look a bit more like the shape of the crowned lapwing. The, the babies, the tiny babies, look like bobbleheads. I don't know how else to put it. They look really seriously top-heavy. Like one of those things somebody might perhaps have on have in their car as a dashboard ornament. David, yes, they do nest on the ground, um, not in trees. They have an interesting approach, lapwings. They barely build a nest. They build a scrape in the ground that basically is just that. It's a hollow so that their eggs don't roll away. And they lay exceptionally, exceptionally camouflaged eggs. How on earth those eggs manage to survive into or hatch into chicks sometimes I really wonder because they put them in the strangest strangest places we've seen it with blacksmith lapwings right near the water you know and you, everything comes to drink at the water holes and yet they lay their eggs right there and you can just imagine how many elephants have been unable to avoid squashing a lapwing egg although the adults do attempt to guard their nests quite viciously. Oh, here we go. You're getting a little bit big to hide under mum now. Or dad. Could be either. When they're a little bit younger, then the adults actually can hide them in their feathers on their bellies and tuck them under their wings so that they disappear and it's just it, it's just legs sticking out. Three banded plovers as well. They're their eggs, beautifully camouflaged eggs, um, but right next to the water. Crowned lapwings are probably the most defensive, though. I think many of us from sort of having childhoods in Africa have been chased by the adult lapwings. They, they will actually actively dive bomb. I vividly remember being a child and having blood drawn from an aggressive pair of, black, of crowned lapwings that were nesting in an open field near the house. And dogs as well. They dive bomb dogs. They're very, very noisy when it comes to protecting their nests. I think that little one's gone to ground in the shade there. I don't blame it. It is very hot. Really hot in the sun today. With pleasure, Kristen. That is a very good point. Something that we forget to do all the time, and we're meant to do it more often than we do, is give you a sort of an idea of the size of the animal that you're looking at. So the adults are probably yay big, yay tall. What would that be? Just about 30 centimeters in height, maybe just a little bit shorter. And then the baby is now probably about half that size. That's how big the baby is running around. So <laughs> Excuse me, thank you, Adrian. Oh, and then in terms of width, I mean that baby is probably about that big. Just to give you a, a perspective, just a bit bigger than a baseball. Actually, probably smaller than a baseball if it was all sort of curled up on itself. Uh, that's a rough perspective, but it is something we don't do nearly often enough. I've done it with a Cory Busted before. I know Brent showed you one earlier, but. Of course it's difficult to get a sense of scale when you're not actually here, when you're watching through the eyes of the camera, but good point. I'll try to do that more often. I, I always forget to, and I know I shouldn't. Okay, let us continue on. There's a lovely valley, by the way, before I do, let me just show you. This is where we slept two nights ago, or tried to. Sleep is a, was not, not, not really quick in coming. But it's a beautiful valley. There's, valley. there's zebras, there's elant, a couple of topi, lots to look at. And in Malika's case, lots to eat. Okay, 
The search continues for mysterious Malaika. I don't really want to let her disappear for more than a day, otherwise I don't think we're going to find her again quickly. Let us jump back across the Mar River into the Triangle to find out what plant life Steve is looking at now. Hmm, thanks Jamie. We've come across one of the thickets we've been driving around on our way to the marsh. We decided to take a little loop. We know that the lions are probably sleeping now, so we're exploring and investigating. We've come across one of the dominant trees that occur in these drainage lines. And there's the orange-winged croton. You can see it there in the picture. It dominates all these sort of drainage lines. They're not very big plants. But what's interesting is the crotons are part of the euphorbia family. And I've actually got a little sample here. And it seems that only the, the older leaves go orange like that. But it makes it quite easy to identify. And I don't know the exact scientific name off the top of my head now. But this plant looks very similar to a plant that we get down in South Africa called lavender croton. And you can see the shiny leaf underneath. It's very silver. And that sort of green on top. Very, very silver. I don't know if you can get right in on that leaf arch. You see the little spots. There's all sorts of little spots on there. All the crotons out there are part of the euphorbia family, like I said, and are generally poisonous. So, best left alone. And uh, I know that what they do in the south, in South Africa, is... Ah, yeah, you can do it as well. The ladies of the Shangan culture, they like to scratch off this white powder. And you can see it on my skin here, but they used to use it as makeup. The croton gratissimus back in South Africa used to use it as makeup. This little shiny, silvery stuff, it's like glitter, look very good on a dark skin. Not very good on my skin. And then those leaves down south as well, if you chew them, are very good for, for mouth ulcers. I'm not going to eat this one now. I might give it a little taste. You all know me. I like tasting. Okay. Not too bad. But the, the crotons in South Africa are advised to eat in very small doses if you're going to eat them. So we're not going to eat this one any further. But very nice. The lions were lying underneath some of these on the other side. And they, they litter these little drainage lines. And crotons, wherever I've seen, apart from the gratissimus in South Africa, are good indicators of water. And this is a drainage line, very good indicator, so nice habitat. We're going to continue on. Hello folks, we're just looking at a tree. They think we have got a beautiful lion or something. No lions. Well done. So, they think we've got lions hiding. I don't think many of the guides stop to talk about, um, talk about trees in the Mara even though there are only a few of them. Still nice every now and again to stop and investigate. We're back all the way onto the main road. That was quite a nice loop arch. Now at least we know where it goes for next time. <laughs> That's good to explore. That's what I've always loved about these reserves. Here's some keys. Go out there and figure out where you're going. Scarlett would like to know, does it storm every day here? And what I've noticed, I've been here since Saturday and it has stormed three times. So no, not every day, but there's definitely rain brewing every now and again. I mean, now, sort of December, January is what they call the short rains in the Mara. And um, yeah, there's been a bit of rain. But I think as we go a little bit further on towards April, then they start getting their longer rains, a little bit more more heavy rains, but it's wonderful to have rain. Uh, Juma had some last night, but you know what, out of, out of a week, I've been here since, uh, since Saturday, so less than a week it's rained three times, so statistically that's still quite high for this time of year. Oh, this is marvelous, open spaces. Judy, any chance of seeing what? Sorry, Faith? Painted wolves. Judy, Judy, you'd like to know if there's any chance of seeing wild dog. And I do believe there are some on the Mara side. And where exactly, I don't know. I mean, wild dog are so unpredictable in their movements. They could be anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did appear at some point. But I couldn't put... A number on that or a time frame nothing sort of limits their movement they move in response to food and whether they're denning or not 
But just like in Juma, suddenly they're there and suddenly they're not. And my two encounters with wild dogs in the Kruger Park were very random. They just were there. So you never know, we might come around a corner and find ourselves a, a wild dog. It's also known as the painted wolf, the African painted wolf. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I must drink some water. That croton has really got me in the back of the... Whoa, sorry, Arch. No marshmallow there. We escaped that, that big hole. We've got some raptors here, Archie. Can you get those? They're just circling above. Oh, sorry. I need to pay attention to the direction he'd like me to go. By the way they're hovering, they seem to be kestrels or something of that nature and they're catching insects on the wing they're moving very fast there they are definitely seem like the same species but very difficult to capture on camera but if anybody got a screenshot there's one Floating there. Ah, we've got bars in the way. They you look like a greater kestrel or something to me. Okay, so we're going to continue on our explorations of this area and still hopefully not get stuck. And I believe Jamie has got a big elephant. I've got just some elephants that are enjoying the vegetation almost as much as Steve does. Oh, and some warthog as well, just thrown in. There's some. There's a nice sort of a scale for you, a comparison in size between a warthog and a herd of elephants. Unfortunately, they are very, very far away. I've got to try and keep still so that I don't rock Adrian's camera. Oh, no, running away, running away. <laughs> Not going to be chased by the elephants today. And then a tiny, tiny, weeny little baby elephant. I nearly didn't see it, actually. I was about to drive in the opposite direction towards the river in this sort of vague gut instinct feeling that perhaps that's the direction Malaika went in. Here we go, look at little one. It's not as tiny as I thought it was. Distance plays tricks on one's eyes. It's still tiny enough, though. And next to Mum, could fit right underneath her belly. Sweet little one. Some lovely big females as well. I wonder if it's not worth... Actually, when I first thought, saw it, I really thought it was a brand, brand new little baby elephant. From the distance that we're at, it, we could barely see it. Keep coming this way. There's a good girl. That's a good girl. A proud cat mama, you say, oh, beautiful Ellie's. Well, yes, indeed. I, I couldn't agree more with that. In these parts, it's actually really nice to see elephants around here. We don't see them that often in this particular place that I am, which is below the ridge of double crossing. We don't see that many elephants around here, so it's really nice to see them. And, of course, we get these spectacular shots of the elephants as they stalk across these wide open plains. There's not a single thing, not a tree, nothing. Just grass all around them. And then the line of the river behind. It's spectacular, it really is. You can see why a cheetah enjoy this particular habitat, although what we know from cheetah is that this is actually not an ideal hunting ground for them. Not, not like this. They need a couple of bushes, a couple of termite mounds, something to keep them hidden as they begin this sort of stalk in the direction of the animals that they're trying to hunt. Otherwise it's game over before it's even begun if they're spotted too soon. Which way are we going, Ellies? Come towards us, please. Ali, um, in terms of snakes hiding in the grass, there's a fair amount. I, 
I have not seen that many snakes in the Mara, to be honest. I know that there are quite a few puff adders around, but they'll be around the w rocky, bushy areas. The, the grass for them, they will be, they will be there, but not in huge numbers. You're more likely to find a snake in a rocky area, somewhere where they've got a little bit of cover. Certainly there'll be underground tunnels that they will be living in, but it's rare to see them out in the open in the grass. The pythons, when we found them, have really seemed to be concentrated around the watery areas, the swampy areas. And the cobras and so on, again, they, they like trees. They like to be close to or around trees, somewhere where they can have a safe spot if they need to hide. Being out in the open like this can be risky. I think you'd find there'd be quite a few, maybe a few more moving around at night. But we don't see them that often in these open grassy areas. There's a mamba that lives in our camp. There's a black-necked spitting cobra that lives in our camp. But again, our camp is right up on the top of the mountain where there's lots of trees around. Lots of bolt holes. And it's very rare. I know a lot of people when they go walking out in the bush, they're always worried about snakes. It's very, very rare for anyone to actually encounter one. Most of the time they hear your vibrations far away, the vibrations of your footsteps, or at least they feel them. And they are long gone before you've gone near. The chance of a snake actually biting somebody, 90% of the snake bites are when people are trying to catch them or play with them, or taunting them or they've trapped them in some way. Or, even worse, trying to kill them or intimidate them by throwing stones at them. That's when snakes bite. But you'd be absolutely fine walking through an open grassland like this. I wonder if that vehicle over there knows where Malaika is. I might need some inside information. I'm going to go off in search of some intel, I think. See if I can get some information on her last movements. Let's go back across to Steve. I know how excited he was about birding in the Mara. Let's go and see which one he's found now. Hmm, thanks, Jamie. Looks like I found an adult male here. I wonder if any of you folks have seen one of these before. I'm just looking on my East African bird app, and it looked like a bird I was familiar with. And it's got a name up in East Africa and then also a name in South Africa and apparently the same bird. I wonder if any of you folks have seen this before. Obviously the genus is Falco and there's a kestrel. All the kestrels fall under the falcon family. And there was two sitting there, male and female, and that is the male now. And I'm going to give it away to you unless you quickly want to comment and let me know what you think. But it's probably the same birds we saw flying just now. Look at that. It's quite a small bird in comparison. Not a very, very big raptor. And they were flying around, nice big fan tail, catching insects on the wing. Sitting in a beautiful Balanites tree overlooking this lovely plain. So it is a kestrel. I wonder if anybody can tell me if they know what it is. Grey head. Stripy chest, rufous wings, a little bit of a yellow yellow on the sear there. You can see he's quite hot. He's got his m mouth open. Not, not, not a breeze to speak of at the moment. But maybe up there there's a bit more. The so comments are coming through very slowly. Really slowly. There he goes. Quite nice white underwing as it flies. Is it going to stop, Arch? Of course not. He's going to continue. So folks, what they're calling it in the East African app up here is definitely a kestrel, but I'm going to wait a little bit longer. Maybe someone will give me an answer. Archie, fantastic following him there. But while we wait, I think um, we're going to back to Jamie. Is that right, Faith? Yeah? Negative? There's a question. <laughs> Are the African kestrels dimorphic, sexually dimorphic? And most of them that I've seen, uh, this one in particular definitely is dimorphic. Um, I'm trying to think if most of them are. Dickinson kestrel is, is very similar. So not all of them are sexually dimorphic, but these two are definitely. 
and because um, the comments are coming through so slowly I'm going to give you the answer. In South Africa we call this a rock kestrel and out here it is known as the common kestrel occurring all over Kenya which is lovely to see and a nice sort of small predatory bird feeding on insects probably on small mice as well but quite predatory in the fact that they will also take birds out of the sky but what loads of these kestrels are able to do is that I don't know if Archie had managed to get it earlier but they're able to flap and sort of almost hover above the ground and then they come down again and very very good for, for catching rodents or anything that's moving through the long grass which you can see there is a lot of okay so if you haven't seen one of those before I hope that adds to your bird list very very rufous in color very very rufous very easily mistaken for the greater kestrel back in South Africa but it is slightly different so I believe Brent is back into an area of nice signal so we're going to go over to him and see if he's got anything new to share I am indeed in an area of good signal however unfortunately the five boys are not so they are very very hungry it seems like they haven't caught anything since we were last there now we test people's eyes now who can see those little white dots there there we go there are five sleepy cheetah they're just beyond a crest where there's no signal about a hundred meters above them you've got a signal but anything below that absolutely nothing so what we've done is I've moved to the area I think they're gonna go there's some Grant's gazelle just down here there's some heart beasts just over there and uh, I'm hoping that that's the area they're gonna move into we can't see the Grant's gazelle they're just beyond that little line of trees that Craig's showing you there there's a, about seven or eight of them um, there's some coax heart beast below us uh, where have they gone now I think they've laid down but they were just down here in the bottom of the valley and the cheetah when we were with them every now and then popped their heads up although there's there's a topi as well um, so there's some game in this area and they are starving so they obviously haven't had too much success now cheetah will hunt when it's a uh, quite full moon but the problem is that the prey species also have much better eyesight during that time so it's likely that they have failed or maybe eaten something small like a scrub hair or, or a baby Tommy which is not gonna not gonna fill up those five boys and that one standing up or well, my eyes playing tricks on me from this distance no okay don't worry they're playing tricks on me but uh, we're gonna play the patience game here because I am almost a hundred percent certain that these boys are gonna get up to hunt and uh, it's quite nice sitting out here in this beautiful open plain waiting for the cheetah to get busy so while we sit here and wait, and uh, hopefully while we're waiting, we'll get some feathered friends to visit us. But in the meantime, Steve's on the hunt for the feathered creatures of the Mara. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Brent. Well done for finding the musketeers. And folks, we've got another raptor in the tree here. And it seems to have been a bit of a mixed species flock here. You can see these ones got much streakier chest. A little bit of a mask just under the eye and very common um, in the, the sort of summer months in South Africa I'm not sure whether they yeah they don't I don't think they occur here all around they're definitely migratory very streaky chest and you can see the little bit of a, a mask just underneath the eye this is a wonderful species that occurs in large flocks coming all the way from the east of Asia where they breed it's an Amur falcon and appears that we, we're not far from where we had those kestrels so there's a number of birds in the area there's not too many trees to speak of so I'm sure roosting in one tree and having a look at insect blooms is quite something to do when uh, you're feeding on insects hunting in a pack see that looks like that looks like another Amur yes you see the yellow the, the orangey legs also be, used to known as the red-footed falcon back in the day they got nice red feet they're often found in, in quite large groups. The largest migrating uh, bird or raptor.
Hannah wants to know if, if South Africa or somewhere nearby has any history of falconry and I'm not sure about that actually. I mean I know that there is definitely something very prominent in, 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 in North Africa. Uh, I don't know anyone who does falconry but I think there is, there is a market for it. There we go. There was the swoop and the dive. Did you see that? Well done Archie. Definitely an action man you are. There he goes. Much whiter under wing. Beautiful. See, look at the flapping. So they're not actually hovering. They are using the wind current to just gently keep them in one position. And then when they see something of interest, down they go. So very good eyesight. They believe that kestrels and falcons have, well, especially kestrels, have the ability to actually see UV light. So UV signatures that rodents would have left, a lot of rodents who move around in the undergrowth here actually use a whole lot of territory markings and they, they urinate from time to time and those signatures get, get, uh, get seen by these birds with a very, very sharp UV signature in their eyesight and then enables them to follow fresh activity and fresh tracks and they'll just hover around an area of very, very fresh sort of urine marking and they'll just wait there and as the rodent comes down very very fast so quite a nice way to hunt if you like looking out for urine <laughs> we're going to continue on lovely afternoon for birds I think it is starting to cool down just a little bit we will probably head on our way towards the marsh again and see what is happening there I have no doubt we'll find some lovely elephants and some buffalo and who knows what other new and exciting birds we can add to the list it just goes on and on so the Amur falcons come all the way from East Asia and they actually follow the migration of I think a dragonfly which is unbelievable. There's a dragonfly, I forget the name, but they migrate together and that's what they feed on as they come along. It facilitates that movement of those birds. It's a phenomenal story. I'll try and find some more information about it to find raptors that move so far and somehow have a food source that they follow all the way is just unbelievable. But unfortunately they are quite highly persecuted in places like India and southern China where they catch them in mist nets and uh, they eat them. So unfortunately that's happening. There's far fewer and more falcons coming through to Africa than there used to be. I reckon 20, 30 years ago there were far more of them coming through. But can you just imagine how many insects and rodents there are just scattered around this field? It just begs. I mean, you see what, what the guys are seeing on Bushwalk in South Africa. Just those small little, little things that we're seeing. And the grass is not even ankle deep. And out here, the grass, if I jumped in here, it would disappear up to my waist. You can imagine how many little things are, are being facilitated in this environment. And if we drove off road here, I guarantee you would probably lose ourselves in some form of a hole. <laughs> which is not what we would like to do. Eleven, um, you're asking a question, is there anything like poison oak or poison ivy in the Mara? I do not know. I have not been here long enough to, to find out and I haven't done any walking yet to hurt my feet. So, oh, unfortunately no, I have not. Maybe Brent, I think he's been around a lot longer. Maybe we should go across and, and see if Brent has an answer to that. But my limited experience here, I don't know if, if there's actually indigenous poison ivy to Africa. I think whatever has come in in the past down in South Africa has come in through, through other plants or through people who've brought seed from elsewhere or a lot of vegetation that came in from, from Argentina during the Boer War. Lots of invasive seeds and stuff came in back in over 150 years ago plus minus and uh, I know that's where a lot of those invasives came from I don't think there's a natural poison ivy down in the south anyway and up here if there is I'll, it's probably not natural but then you know I don't know I'm just guessing there wonderful So we're going to go over to Brent and see if Brent can ask, answer the question about poison ivy for you. Oh, what a... Well, hello. And as we've been scouring the hills around us, waiting for the five boys to get up and get moving, uh, we've got a, a lovely question about 
poison ivy or poison oak. I'm not sure who it was from. Oh, wait a second and I'm sure I will find out. From Steve. Uh, Steve would like to know if there's any poison ivy or oak in the Mara. There is not how, um, at all, unfortunately. Uh, well, fortunately, not unfortunately, uh, there are other nasties. Um, there's various different types of stinging nettles that occur in the River Rhine forests. And um, there are some very nasty uh, creepers uh, from, oh, I've forgotten the scientific name now, but they don't have a common name, that have very fine hairs um, that really, really itch and burn, uh, but no poison ivy or oak. So stinging nettles and some uh, creeper species I will remember their name just now. They don't have a, a normal English name, they only have a, a, a scientific name. Can't remember, unfortunately. Now, as I say, you can actually have a look to where we stay, or more or less, I can sort of show you where we stay. So, when we're here, there we go, well, oh, Craig, good sense of direction. So, in in these that line of trees around there, that is where Camp Olo Shaiki is, on the Talek River, and a little bit downstream from there, that's the bend where you went running yesterday, Craig, so it's probably, oops, where's my hand gone? There. So, there we go, along the Talek River there, and you can see some of the Maasai homesteads and farmlands just behind, and uh, you can just, can you make out Talek Town from here? No, it's hidden behind a large group of trees. So that big group of trees down there. So Talek Town is actually behind that group of trees there. Now that open plain there along the edge of the Talek River is called the Posey Plain. And I think it's probably got that nickname uh, from the white oh, from the white flowers, the, the, the flay ink flowers that adorn it. Um, I'm not sure what Posey flowers look like, but I think uh, that's sort of my logical thinking about how it possibly got that name would be from the flowers. We've got a few up here, but uh, there's a lot more if you look down um, on, there we go, there's some flay ink flowers there. It, on down on those flat, wetter areas, obviously a flay is a wet area, so and they grow well there. Now, the wonderful thing about them is they can choose to be parasitic or not, depending on the conditions that are uh, around them. So if there's enough water, enough nutrients in the soils where they are... Oh, now, Batman's found another flower. I'm not sure what that one is. I don't know what that one is, Batman. Uh, I'll have to have a closer look. But uh, so th those flay ink flowers there, so they can choose to be parasitic or not. So when everything's great, good and great and grand, they are not parasitic. And uh, when times become a bit tough, their roots will actually go into the grass that surrounds them and they will suck the nutrients from the grass species. Ben 10 would like to know, does the Mara ever experience drought? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, last year was a bit of a drought, but uh, you must remember droughts d differ depending on where you are. So even though the Mara can look quite green in comparison to uh, the Sabi Sands, it could still be in a drought. So that's one of the interesting things. So um, it has been a bit dry, but we've had a lot of rain in January this year, which is unusual. So it's been very good and unusual rain in January. Normally January, February are the driest months. We've had one or two showers in February, so maybe this late or early rain, depending if you look at it, um, will set, do, do the Mara well. Coming into the big rains, normally start March, April, well, sort of actually probably April, May, June are when the big rains fall, and then the little rains in November, December, but they carried on into January this year with very good rain. Okay, now I'm going to have a quick look if the cheetah is still absolutely flat in the same position, which they are. So while we look at those lovely crepuscular rays and wait for the five boys to get up and are marching, let's go see what Jamie's doing not too far from where I am now. I am going to where, well hopefully I'm not too far from where Malika is now, more to the point. I think... I found out where she is. It's not far, in fact this is exactly where we watched her two boys playing in the rain. 
uh, well, after it rained. Craig and I were caught in the most ridiculous downpour that turned the road into a river. And Malika's boys just had the best time. They were playing, they were chasing the water, they were dashing all around. So they really were, they were having an absolute ball. So this is where the, this is where we were, and I think she's just down here, I think. Oh, possibly not. Just upstream, he said. Which should be somewhere here. This should be somewhere near the salt lake. Ooh, doo -doo. She might have moved as well. Is that her there? Can you see where I'm looking? No, that can't be her, can it? Or is that just an odd stump? Let me just... My binoculars are buried, sorry. When you spend nights out, you end up... Now I'm looking... I'm looking there. There's a st either a stump or a cheetah. There, but where that big tree is. I can't find my binoculars. They're <laughs> somewhere under my sleeping bag. <laughs> They're here, I promise. Ha ha! Ha! They were under my hairbrush. No, it's a rock. Never mind. After all that. It is not a cheetah. So where is she? Let's go. Okay, let's go. Ah, oh, Melinda. Now we are in an absolutely massive area. Melinda's wondering about if this is all protected land. And yes, it is. It is protected. The animals here are perfectly safe to live as they would in the wild. It is the wild. This is as wild probably as it gets, or almost as it gets. It is, however, completely unfenced. So this is a national reserve. Around the national reserve are cons what are known as conservancies, where the local people have actually allowed tourists to come in, view the animals, they live with the animals, but they still live on that land. So they will still graze their cattle, they will still collect water, they will still move about as as they do on that land that surrounds this area. So just over here is a Laurel Rock Conservancy. And it that it, it's hard to explain exactly how it works because it's all quite complex. But yes, this is a national reserve. This is protected land. The triangle is protected land. That's on the other side of the river, the Mara Triangle. We drive in both of those places. But as Brent was talking about, when something, for example, happens like a drought, then the cows that come from the conservancies or live in the surrounding areas will be preserved, usually at night, to come and graze. But for the most part, it's a very peaceful thing, and animals like the cheetah that we see are completely 100% safe. They're of no threat to the people that come and go on the borders of this land. So there are no fences, but yes, it is a protected area, it is a protected reserve. Now First Lady Shah, how many rivers there are there in the Mara? Okay, so there's a few, but in terms of big rivers, the Mara is the biggest, and then you have the Sand River that runs along the border with Tanzania. And that is the second biggest. Then within that, there are a whole load of little tributaries that tribute, contribute to the bigger rivers themselves. So the Talek is probably one of the bigger ones. This river here that we're coming to, that double crossing goes through, that's the Olore Orok River. Ah, I found her. That wasn't hard. Ha! Ah, surprise! I found her by following the car. And where was I going with the, my next train of thoughts? So there's a whole load of little rivers. There's the Rungkai Valley, which has several different Rungkai tributaries. There's a lot of little rivers. And then from there, it's deciding if it's a lugger or if it's a river. A lugger is a big ditch because most of the time, most of these little tributaries won't flow unless it's raining. Like, it has been over the past few days, so there's water here. This 
is where Malaika crossed, if you cast your mind back, if you can remember that far back, her, she jumped across here with her boys, this rocky section. She's now getting frighteningly close to the conservancy boundary. Almost like she's waiting for our live series that starts on the 4th. It's almost like she's waiting to disappear on me and go into the conservancy. I will be very upset if you do that, Malaika. I'll probably cry. Oh, there we go. There's, there's the problem, Tom. So Tom's wondering if Malaika has a territory or if she roams freely. And the answer to that is a female cheetah doesn't really have a territory. They have a home range, which is an undefended territory. It's a, or at least it's, it's an area in which they move about and they know quite well. But that doesn't mean they won't go beyond their home range. So female cheetah in certain areas could almost be considered to be nomadic. In that they move around so frequently. I'm pretty sure this is her. Either that or it's the world's most interesting bush to have gathered so many observers. Am I missing? Oh, uh, that's not her. Those don't have spots. Those don't have spots at all. Those are lions. Not that I'm disappointed. I'm happy. I'm always happy to find lions. It's just not quite what I was expecting to find. Oh well, back to the drawing board. Hello everyone. You all look thrilled. Hello. Huh. We the Malaik has grown and cheetahs have changed their spots. Although that's not Malaika. <laughs> Having spent two nights or several nights with her, I'm going to safely say that is not a cheetah. And that, of course, is why you turn to us all as your safari guides. It's for those little pearls of wisdom. As for which lions we are with, or where they came from, or who they are, I have absolutely no idea. Well, they've got spots of a sort. Sorry? I'm sorry, hold on a second, I'm, somebody's trying to, I don't know what he's trying to say to me. Pardon? Ah, oh, the leopard, ah. Uh, where's Malaika? Where? Exactly. No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any today. Sorry, no, don't, sorry. Let me duck down so that we don't finish that conversation which was going nowhere. Um, Lady Starfire, it's possible, especially given that Cat's natural instinct is, is to catch and kill things. Lady Starfire was wondering if, if a lion would catch and eat a python for food. Yes, they, they might. Uh, it's unlikely, but it is possible. Leopards are, of course, known for catching and eating pythons. It's rare, but it does happen. So if a lion pride were to come upon a big python and couldn't get away, yes, it's possible that they would kill it. Uh, it would probably provoke them by striking back, which would cause them to actually turn around and try and catch it. Uh, yes, it is entirely possible that they would catch it and then if they caught it they might decide to eat some of it. But it's le it's less for food and it's more just because that's their natural instinct. It's that cat-like instinct to chase and to catch something that moved away from them. Swift little bath from one of the lionesses. Okay, please forgive me. I probably need to try and finish having that conversation that guy was trying to have with me. I think he was just asking me if I found a leopard. But let's, while I do that, send you across to Steve and see something else with spots that's not a cheetah. 
Yeah, thank you, Jamie. How did you think li Cheetah was a lion? I don't know what <laughs> happens in this long grass, I suppose. But we have found a very tall animal. And uh, another reason why these thickets, these little croton and whatever thickets are so important. There we have one giraffe. And what's quite amazing and so important about these little drainage lines is to facilitate the number of giraffe that we have in the area. All the other places you've seen, it's just wide open spaces with very limited amounts of leaves. But if we go just this side, it is an unbelievable spectacle of giraffe in the thickets here. There are so many. And there's just three in shot. And obviously that, that thicket wooded woodland area behind facilitates all of these giraffe. And as Archie pans left, you'll see all of them. There is, there must be more than 30 giraffe in this area. All with their, le their necks bending really low down to feed at the height of the, of the impala. It is gorgeous. Pisces Bob it is gorgeous we actually when we left the lions this morning on our way home we came past this area and we saw these giraffe and it was just as the show was ending it was either us showing you a couple giraffe or you having some last glimpses of Hosanna and it looks like the little prince won the show this morning but now these giraffe get their opportunity look how they even in the open area they still got their heads down and I think there's little pans of water in and amongst this area which um, is actually quite a nice area for them to drink. We just came on a road now that the, the water was still flowing. And so if this giraffe spreads its legs to get really, really low down, we'll probably have a drink. But there's a huge amount of them here, and they're all in a big journey together. They haven't gone very far from this morning. They were actually all sitting down this morning, ruminating, probably after a long night of feeding. Oh, she looks like she's glowing. Looks a little bit pregnant there. Gestation period of giraffe is about 14 months, 15 months. And I know in the last month or so there's been two young giraffes up a tree with leopard kills. So yes, very wow. There we go, there's two of them. Both, both females. And you can see by her intention, she's definitely keen on whatever's down on the floor there. And I don't think it's any leaves. But we could always wait and see. It is wonderful to see this amount of giraffe. It's been years since I've seen this many. The Kruger Park in the open places has got wonderful amounts of giraffe. Sort of in the Satara area, the sort of central Kruger. Huge amounts of giraffe. They feed on all the sort of stunted knob thorns around there towards the Winnetsi picnic site in the Kruger Park. And uh, Juma, we don't get too many because uh, the vegetation is quite dense. The giraffe like to be able to see. They obviously like leaves, but they also want to be able to see. They don't like hanging out in areas that are too thick. And there we go. Our kneeling warthogs having a feed. The life out here is just fantastic. There we go. Looks like a... Is that a young male? There's two pairs of warts on the face. What I always love is you look at the warthog and you see that little beard, the white beard on either side. And even when they're born, they've got that white beard. And that's kind of a mimic, mimicry for them. It kind of imitates tusks or tushes. You can see that one has got it just on the side. You can't see it very clearly. But when they're born, they've got them. So what that facilitates, I think, is that when a cheetah or a leopard sees the young warthog, if the warthog turns towards it, it might see these this big white beard on either side and think it's a tusk and then invariably give it that moment where it leaves it alone thinking oh I don't want to tackle that animal it's going to hurt me it gives the warthog that moment to get away I've watched Ralph a few times in the last week or so with lions trying to hunt and you can tell how intimidating those tusks can be and the lions often invariably leave that warthog in, in worrying not getting that tusk in the belly Roshni wants to know why warthogs kneel while eating and I think it's because they, they can feed on taller grass but they also have the ability to feed right down on the ground and they also snuffle in and dig up the roots and tubers so they haven't evolved to have longer neck so they kneel to get much more sort of purchase on the ground to get much lower 
um, and if their legs were shorter they wouldn't be able to run as well as they do so it's kind of a product of of, a, of evolution I'd say and there that one's walking quite nicely and just munching the grass seeds as it goes along but when they really want to get down right down on the ground and snuffle up the roots and dig up some tubers they need to to basically go down on their knees it gives them a little bit more as you'd say like a plow motion if you've ever seen a plow in the ground as it pushes forward the, the sort of the weight is coming from the back and the angle is sort of pushed forward allows that nose to dig in and gives them a little bit more sort of power I would say that would be my guess oh, just go right here all these giraffe are looking Archie have a look at all of those heads look at all of them they're all looking in the, towards the right and giraffe are to me probably the most reliable indicator of predators that you get when you see them all looking in one direction there's a very good chance that there's something there so I think we're gonna go around and see what we can find on that side because the giraffe will just stare at whatever that is until it goes away so look at that isn't that a picture you can see the intention can't you all the eyes and ears in one direction and they're not too distressed though the one on the right there is busy chewing but that's why they hang out in nice groups like this gives them the chance to to watch each other's back so to speak wow. lovely lovely light on these giraffe sorry faith I just got the end of that there Nadine, a good question, would a larger herd better protect the young from predators? And what they will do is that they're not necessarily protecting an individual youngster. They will be protecting their own youngsters. But by hanging out in a herd like this, they have many more eyes and ears. So it's impossible for a lion to get near this herd. And also the lion would have to pick one of these individuals out and try and select them. Which is very, very hard to do when every single one of them is looking at you. Very hard to sneak up on the what I think is the animal with the best eyesight out here, probably baboon and then giraffe. So I think in a herd like this, the safety numbers element, yes, I don't think the giraffe do it to benefit each other. They do it to benefit themselves and maybe their offspring. But uh, they hang out, the vegetation is obviously very good here, so it's a good place to hang out. Maybe a bit of social gathering, it's very loose aggregations, there's no territorial behavior in giraffe. The, Males just follow the females around for breeding, but there's no parental care given from the males. But it would be impossible to sneak up on that journey there without being seen. So I think they do it because it, look how difficult it is for a giraffe with its head down like that to see what's going on. And a lot of the shrubs here are quite short. Sorry. Are you okay? Thanks guys. So I didn't move over there. Dave, how many giraffe can I see? We can't. I can see about 28. There's also a couple on my right. That was a very quick count though. Very quick count. But they've all seemed to relax again. What's possible is that a warthog or something came out of a burrow towards where they were looking and they all looked at it very diligently until they realized it was a warthog and then they all slowly went back to their feeding so nothing of interest on the other side but what I just love is you see how far down the giraffe can can bend their necks they really just have no competition out here as long as there's these thickets for them you will have giraffe so they can compete with all the other antelope the impala feeding low down Eland and Kudu. I haven't seen Kudu up here. I'm sure you get Kudu. Arch? Kudu? I haven't seen Archie's not sure. I haven't seen any Kudu, but the giraffe just have no competition when it comes to that. And these little habitats perfect for them. But folks, we're gonna move on, go around, see what else we have. I see some elephant in the distance. We're slowly making our way towards the, the marsh breakaways, getting quite a nice feel of the land. I know it is quite flat and the big plateau behind the scrap and behind makes it a bit easier to navigate but we've been on these little windy two-track muddy roads and nearly got stuck <laughs> but it has not happened yet 
We're doing very, very well. So we're going to continue on and see what we can find. And while we do so, we're going to go to Jamie, who's still in search of that beautiful cheetah. I am still in search of that beautiful but somewhat contrary cheetah. Now the reason that I'm so determined to find her, obviously I left the lions and I wouldn't normally do that. But I've left them because I really want to find her and I really want to see where she is. A lot of the time I've been told that a cheetah is Malaika and it hasn't been. Or somebody's told me that Malaika's at Lookout Hill when I've just seen her at Talek River kind of thing. So I want to lay eyes on her. I want to make sure it was her that they had this morning and that she is around here because it'll make life a great deal easier if we can keep track of her until we go into our prime time series because I do want to I feel as though Malaika's story is an important one to share with the world she's a special cat I do want to try and make sure we have her for for our TV shows that's and I just want to see her I'm gonna spend as much time as possible with those boys before they disperse so she was here and she was here at around about 12 it's now about quarter to five or so I actually don't know what time it is no, she's, she's here somewhere. She wouldn't have, I don't think she would have gone far. It was really hot this afternoon. Isn't this a beautiful area? It's so different to the kind of scenery that we're usually driving around in. Now, oh, Matt. You are absolutely correct, one should never run from animals. But I assume you're talking more in the sort of recreational sense. Matt's wondering if running is a dangerous activity here, do the animals ever chase us? So running in, a, in an area like this, especially jogging with headphones, would be probably a fatal idea at some point, especially if you had headphones in. We do run in the reserves, we run on Juma, we don't run in the Mara, we run up at the top near the airstrip, but it is something that can be potentially dangerous. So it's an undertaking that people shouldn't, shouldn't do unless they are experts in their field. So for example, James or, James or Steph will do a lot of running, and that's okay because they're constantly looking. Sorry, I'm, I'm watching a, a very low helicopter. Maybe we can recruit them for our search. But they're constantly aware of their surroundings and they know what to do. Yes, if you run past a lion or a leopard or a cheetah, their instinct is to hunt. They, they chase things that run. And that includes human beings. That's why when you're on foot, the most basic rule is that you never, ever, ever run. First is you don't run. Second is you listen to do it and do whatever you're told because things like these guys like to take people by surprise. Now I don't know if any of you saw that sighting with Malaika and the and her impala kill, but the buffalo came in and flipped that entire 60, 70 kilogram impala kill straight up into the air in a full circle. That thing did a full 360 degree spin. You don't want to be the victim of their anger. So even a buffalo could easily chase you if you run. And unfortunately none of us can run, outrun anything here. If you're really lucky, you might be able to outrun something like a hippo. Thomas, why are buffalo so ornery? I think it's a combination of things. I think it's the fact that they are quite short-sighted, which of course means that they can't exactly make a judgment call about what it is that's going on. They're also massive, so evolutionary-wise, the, the case of sort of chase first and ask questions later has done quite well for them, because they're basically one large four-legged battering ram. Uh, most things will think twice when faced with a buffalo running at them head on. They're also, I think, 
basically programmed to be that way. Now the older bulls, the ones that are separate from the rest of the herd, they are the ones that are the most dangerous. So a big buffalo herd of about 500 is probably safer to encounter on foot than one solitary, what we call a dugger boy. And again, it's that situation where there's both safety in numbers and a reaction, a, a sort of a herd reaction. So a herd of 500 buffalo will probably see you get a fright, turn around and run away. And any buffalo that might have thought twice about that will be caught up in the spirit of the herd and, and be, you know, instinctively run with them. Whereas a big lone buffalo bull or one or two lone buffalo bulls, they're more vulnerable and they are more likely to actually attack first and ask questions later, if indeed they ever do ask questions. A buffalo is also quite unlikely to change its mind. Once it is propelling itself forward towards you, it is unlikely to turn around and to run away from you. Whereas something like an elephant or a lion, they give warning charges. A buffalo is most, most likely going to follow through if it's running at you. We don't ever call them mock charges. Uh, Mary, the, the Duggar boys, it's a sort of a, it's a South African term. We have found no equivalent in the Mara for the Duggar boys. And it's basically the mud boys. The boys that enjoy a bit of time in the mud. So it's not, not the, it's, it's not pronounced Dacha, which is a South African term for, well, I think you, I think you'll probably know what is, what is a South African term for, recreational drug. It is Dugger, the Dugger boys, the mud boys. And that's because they do really enjoy spending a great deal of time in muddy wallows, cooling themselves down. Now those you don't want to encounter while you're jogging. And the, you know, when you're jogging and you're running through an area, then you're tired. And from there, when you're tired, then you are less likely to pay attention. You're less likely to look around you. You're not as focused as you would be if you're walking through an area. So going jogging, unless you're a fully qualified person who's lived in the wilderness for a while, is a very bad idea. Oh, they all think I've found Malaika now. I'm sorry, I haven't found Malaika for you. There's some buffalo. Ben, the distant connection with cows is just that. It is a distant, distant connection. So in, a, in as much as they are, and they are ruminants, they are bovids, they are related to cows, but it is a very, very uh, distant relationship. So we, this particular species is also not a water buffalo. A lot of people have referred to them as water buffalo. They are a Cape buffalo, um, something that extends all the way from, Kate, from the Cape, and they are a bit larger than a water buffalo. Very grumpy. Very, very grumpy creatures. They always look grumpy as well. They look at you, we've always, we always say that they look at you like you owe them money. Okay, so just to fully wrap up that conversation, cows in no way came from, from buffalo. There's no, dis there's no connection there. It is a very distant relative. Okay, so they're definitely not cows, but uh, for the lions out here, they are certainly a welcome meal. Good afternoon, 
or good morning wherever it is in the world you may be from welcome to the uh, sorry to the Maasai Mara the Mara Triangle all the way up in Kenya my name is Steve Falkenbridge and I'm joined by Archie on camera I'd like to welcome all the new viewers and Ellenson Elementary Shelton Park Elementary welcome to this live game drive safari from myself in the Mara and we're gonna have some friends joining us shortly all the way down 1600 miles down in South Africa and we have a present for you something very cute and cuddly in the long grass. Please boys and girls from the elementary school send your questions and comments through with your teacher. We'd love to have you interactive with us this afternoon. Tell us what you think. Let us know what you'd like to see. We have found some lions. Yes, they are lions and they are wild. You can see there's a couple adults there and there's a little cub, two cubs. Aren't they just the cutest little things? We believe this is part of one of the prides here that we call the Marsh Breakaway Pride. And we had them this morning in this area eating what we think was a warthog. We're not sure because all we saw was a foot. Very hard to identify an animal just by the foot. Isn't that just the most precious thing you've ever seen? Oh, it's very cute. It's so nice to see little cubs running around and moving. You can see the adults are basically just lying down doing not too much. There in the background you can see a couple other cubs and a big foot of another lioness and that is where we think the the meat was that they had this morning but uh, it's very hard to see what's going on in there at the moment. It's just a bundle of kittens and or cats and feet. Lots of fur balls. There's two lioness, three, four, five lioness it seems lying flat in the grass. That's what lions do best at this time of day, enjoying the, the shade of, of what a wonderful tree in what we call the savanna biome. Savanna biome because it's made up of trees and grass. Mm, Allenton, you are learning about animal habitats. Now we've been talking a little bit about habitats this morning. Oh, there we have the cub going in and suckling. The cubs are still quite young. They look about three, three, four months. They're still quite dependent on mum for milk. So animal habitats and lion habitats, lions enjoy to have, um, oh, we've got the female coming in from the left there, Arch. If you just want to pan left, yeah, she's coming in. There's the cubs. This is perfect lion habitat. There's lots of animals. Uh, there's long grass. There's small bushes. Look at all of those little cubs. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They've they've come on, they've come alive just for you out there. I hope you are enjoying. So this is what we call a pride, and a pride of lions is made up of of the females, so mummies, uh, sisters, and daughters, and those youngsters there. There could be young boys there, but when they get about three, plus minus three or so, they get pushed away, and they have to go do their own thing. But if they're female, they'll stay in the pride with their mother and their grandmother, and they eat meat. And these guys like to hang around in the savannah, where there's lots of camouflage for them. There needs to be some shade, as you can see. It gets very hot out here. It's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit right now. So without the shade, I don't think any of the, most of the animals in the area would survive. So habitat, you need food. You need water, there's lots of water behind us. About a few miles is the Maasai Mara River and we are in a very big marshy swamp system where there is lots of water because the soil is very marshy. So the water is here, there's animals around. We just spend some time just now with a, a big herd of giraffe. There's lots of impala and buffalo and all of these things are very important for the lions and for their food. Oh, look at that. So you see, we counted about eight little cubs there. Derek, what other different animals, you ask, there are out here? And we will show you. But we have elephants, we have buffaloes, there are black rhino somewhere, uh, there are cheetah, hyena, pumba, the warthog, of course, and there are lots and lots of birds. We've got waterbuck and giraffe. 
what else? There's a whole list of them out here, the Topi and the Thompson's Gazelle. And we're hoping to, in the next 45 minutes, show you as many of these animals as we can. I do have two other friends that are out with me, and I believe they are looking at some other animals as we speak. So you are very fortunate that you have quite a few of us around to show you all the animals as they go about what they do. Beautiful to see these lionesses together. And lots of babies. They like to have their babies at the same time so that they can also suckle them at the same time. It doesn't really matter if it's mum or auntie who suckles the baby. That's one of the benefits of lions. Oh, isn't she just too cute? Don't you think you could just walk up there and scratch her on the tummy? I wouldn't advise that. These are wild, wild animals. And this is coming to you live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya. There we go. Look at that. A little rub on the head. That's what lions do. They're very social. They like to spend time together and they do a lot of fighting when they feed so they have to spend a lot of time giving each other cuddles because they do get quite aggressive when they eat so when they're not eating they do lots of licking and rubbing and the little cubs do lots of playing as well look at that <laughs> probably one of the cutest things in the world is a little lion cub but look how camouflaged it is in the long grass there boys and girls if Archie just pans out a bit you actually see how these animals all disappear. Ava and Aiden ask, why do lions eat meat? That is how they have been created to eat meat. There are lots of animals out here that eat meat. And there's lots of them that eat grass and lots that eat leaves. So there needs to be a balance. And you see how the lions just disappear in the long grass. Can you imagine you're walking here? You just see that little flick of a tail. So you see there's lots of grass out here and lots of trees and there's lots of animals that eat the grass and the trees and if we didn't have any animals that ate those animals then it would be out of balance. So nature out here is all about balance and if you have lots of herbivores such as buffalo and impala and wildebeest then you need lots of lions and hyenas to eat them. It is the circle of life it is just the way it is. Lions are fully adapted to eat meat. Their teeth are designed to cut and to shear and to gorge into meat. That is the way they are. All the carnivores, so all the animals that eat meat. So jackal, hyena, lion, leopard, cheetah, all their teeth are perfectly designed to cut meat. We use knives to cut our meat. We do use our teeth sometimes, but it doesn't work as well as a knife. But lions have got everything they need in their mouth. Isn't that marvelous? Wild lions coming to you from Kenya. So we think they had a warthog this morning. We're not sure if it was a warthog, but it didn't go very far between them. Five adult lionesses, the cubs, aren't really eating too much meat at the moment. They'll eat a little bit, but they're drinking a lot of mum's milk right now. And so they, they make use of the shade now to sleep with their full bellies. And while we watch them a bit longer, we're going to go all the way down to South Africa. I believe my friends there, Scott Dyson, is now out on safari. And he has found for you an absolutely wonderful bird, which is the national bird of Botswana. The big cats that we're interested about seeing on safari, but also the birds. And a lot of the times the lions are hard to find. And... Lots of the birds we get to see out here are beautiful, just like this one. This bird's got lots of different colors, about seven or eight colors. And, oh, there it goes. Off to find another branch to sit on, where they like to wait and look for their prey, where they fly down and then catch them. My name's Scott, and it's wonderful to have all the kids with us on their first safari. And we are in South Africa now, so you've moved from Kenya right to the southern tip of Africa where we are driving around in a different reserve to where Steve is and I'm teamed up with Senzo on camera. We are hoping to find another big cat for you this afternoon. Not a lion, not a cheetah, but a leopard. And they are my favorite big cats and there's quite a few of them here, more than in the Mara where you were with Steve. The 
the area here is better for leopards than it is up in the Mara because it's very open in the Mara and leopards like to sneak around and have lots of hiding places. But they certainly welcome back. We're sorry about that, folks. We we're having a few technical difficulties in South Africa, but you must imagine we're trying to stream live, live broadcasting to you all the way from South Africa to wherever you are in the world. And look at what has just come out of the forest the world's largest land mammal. The African elephant. And to the right of it there is a Cape Buffalo. You can't really see because his head is down. But there that looks like two bull elephants on the left and then two buffalo on the right. Look at that. They are feeding, I think they're, oh it's actually one. It's one buffalo. The lion on its back because they like to sit in mud. And it's also what is important for buffalo's habitat is mud. They like to wallow in the mud to keep them nice and cool. And there are lots of Biting flies. Oh, Sydney, you're asking a question. I'm, I'm busy answering that question. You ask, why do they swim in muddy water? First of all, buffaloes need the mud to help them cool down. Uh, if you cover yourself in mud, it keeps the sun off of you, and also the mud can be quite cool. Another reason is that there's lots and lots of insects that bite here and sting. And by covering yourself in mud, you, you, you keep those things from stinging you. It's almost like a like you're putting on some form of covering. There we go. Look at those big horns. Big bull buffalo. And another reason is also that there's lots of ticks that we find out here. And the ticks, they suck the blood of the buffalo. And if the buffalo wallows in the mud, he covers his body in mud. And it actually suffocates those ticks and they fall off. Because they can't breathe through the mud. So it's very important for them. So when it comes to buffalo habitat, they also need shade. Very important for them to have shade. And they need long grass like what you can see here and then they need to be very close to water and then mudding mud wallows are very very important i think they actually enjoy it oh look at that look in the front of the picture there boys and girls what have we got i wonder if any of you can tell me what that is lurking in the grass looking at the lions with those pointed ears it's not a fox it's not a jackal Giovanni, you are wondering if there are hyenas? You have just answered your own question, young sir. Oh, that was a hyena that has just slumped down onto the ground. We had a few hyena here this morning that were competing with these lions, uh, but they were very scared. They th I thought they were going to have a bit more fun with them, but they were way too scared. The lions chased them off. But these females are ferocious. They made a lot of noise, and the hyenas tucked their tails and ran away. Well, there we go. Elephants, you see two youngsters on the left having a little bit of a play. And then some more on the right. Micah asks if there's water near the elephants. And this whole area that we're in is very marshy. There's a lot of water on the ground. And behind the elephants, that big tree line indicates that there's water. And on the other side of that is the major massive big Mara River that comes all the way oh there the hyenas running in the front there he goes isn't that marvelous I think it's a, it looks like a female but yes there is water on the other side of the tree and in the marsh there's lots of water so elephants habitat they need lots of water as well like the buffalo they need lots of trees and lots of grass and essentially lots of large wide open spaces for them to be able to survive and what's really interesting is that when we conserve elephants, because they need such a big area, huge, huge area to conserve elephants, by conserving elephants we conserve everything else. From the little beetles, to the little insects, to the little flowers and plants that we find. So that's marvelous, the conservation. And this is all wild. These animals are all wandering through the wilderness. They're all just doing their own thing. We don't lock them up anywhere. They move completely freely within Kenya and Tanzania. There's no fences around here. On the very, very east and west there might be, but there's huge areas for them to move. 
Derek, no. Derek, you can't touch the animals. These animals are wild. Wild, wild, wild animals. And that's what's wonderful is we can come out here and they get quite used to the vehicle. So we can get quite close to them in the vehicle. But I would by no means try and get out of my car and go and touch them. That is not supposed to happen. Um, there are places in the world where you can touch wild anim or animals, but they are rehabilitated or they are in petting zoos and not ideally wild. So these animals are completely wild. And what we can see, and you've seen now already, it's a buffalo, elephant, and the lion on the left. All three are part of the Big Five. Have you heard of the Big Five, boys and girls? The Big Five is how we advertise and get people to come out here. They are five very dangerous animals. And it is a very good marketing tool because when we get you out here and we talk about the elephants and we talk about the buffalo, we then get a chance. Oh, look at the little babies. We then get a chance to talk about insects and grasses and trees, which is always very interesting to me. Isn't that special? So you can see they're using that trunk to grab the grass which they're then putting in their mouth. Elephants like the buffalo are feeding on very similar sort of vegetation right now and um, this area has got a huge amount of grass for them to feed on which is very important and it, is, it enables us to have lots and lots and lots of animals in the area which is very special. So we're going to go from these very special animals to my friend Jamie who's on the other side of the river we see there who's got another very special animal. I've got two very special animals and a very warm welcome to the kids who have joined us today. I hope that you are having the best time. Now we'll take a look at the zebra in a moment, but just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Jamie and this afternoon Adrian is on camera with me and we are sitting with uh, some lovely, lovely zebra. So there we go, there are the zebra over there. And if you look closely, you can see that they've also got some passengers riding on their backs. Now that is a type of bird known as an oxpecker. And the oxpecker actually combs through the zebra's fur to catch things like ticks and parasites and all kinds of other things. Now looking at the zebra, I can tell you that the zebra has been a very, very lucky zebra. Look at that. Can you see that scar there along the back of the zebra? You can see its stripes don't quite match up. There's a little bit of gray skin there and there down the back of its leg. Now that could easily have been when it tried to, or when it did actually successfully escape from a lion or another type of predator. So those look to me like potential claw marks from where a lion tried to catch the zebra and in this case, the zebra was lucky and it actually managed to, to escape. Now, I don't necessarily know for certain that that was caused by a lion or something like that, because it could also have been caused by another zebra. Now, believe it or not, zebra are actually quite aggressive animals, especially with each other. And even the females will kick and bite when another one gets into the sort of the wrong place in her line. So zebra are very, very, I suppose you could say quite rough with each other. The stallions fight each other, they bite and they kick in order to be able to get a female to have the right to mate with her and the females often kick each other just because they can. Now in this case this looks like a male zebra it's quite hard to tell sometimes, but this looks like a male zebra to me. And so it could possibly have been caused in a fight with another male zebra. Now, Brianna, there's a good question. Now, Brianna's wanting to know why a zebra have stripes. I'll tell you a little secret. Nobody 
actually knows why zebra have stripes. Lots of people have come up with lots of different reasons. So one of the explanations put forward is that it helps to camouflage them. That's the, the main explanation. That's, that's the main reason why people say zebra have stripes. It helps to hide them away. Well, you might think, but I can see them really clearly, but that's because they're close to us. Now, on a big herd of zebra, when a predator is chasing them, the stripes sort of make them all blend into each other. So it's hard for the predator to decide which one they're going to try and catch, which zebra they're going to try and catch. But there's other explanations as well. Some people say it helps because it's hot out here, because the, hot, the, the black stripes heat up faster than the white stripes. Some people say it's for insects. So there's lots and lots of different explanations. And the truth is, and I think it's a wonderful thing, is that nobody actually knows for certain. But the main argument for zebras having stripes is camouflage. Isn't that fascinating? That even though we've, we've spent so much time with these animals and people have done so much research, they still don't know everything there is to know. Oh, that's just one of the complicated things of life out here. Now, if we go back and join Steve with his elephants, he can tell you that we definitely don't know everything there is to know about them either. Thanks, Jamie. We have got the cutest little bunch of elephants here. There's some females there with a whole lot of babies. And can you see the question you asked before? Is there water nearby? See how these elephants are picking up the mud. There's lots of mud around. They pick the mud up and like the buffalo, they like to throw it all over their skin. It also helps them to keep cool. Look at that beautiful elephant. Lots of them around. Avery, that's a very good question. How long? Oh, there's the hyena again. The elephant has just chased the hyena. How long does an elephant live? It's quite similar to us. Elephants up in the Maasai Mara can live up to about 65 years, plus minus. When they go down to, when you go down to sort of South Africa where they feed a lot more leaves and sticks and bark, probably 55 to 60 because they eventually their teeth wear down and they don't have the benefit of a dentist like we do and their teeth wear down and eventually they shame it's very sad to say they starve to death but up here because there's so much more grass and moisture they live a little bit longer but let's look at these Ellie some more because they are having so much fun over there look at all those little babies there they're also busy playing in the mud Marina how do elephants eat you ask well, you see that trunk that they're busy using to pick up the mud? They do the same with the trunk. The tip of, look, there's a baby underneath her there rolling on the floor. They use the trunk, and the tip of the trunk has actually got two very, very good fingers. And they use it. Here we go. Let's see if this one's going to do it now. There we go. Look how it's using the trunk. And it's busy ripping up the grass or whatever foliage that might be. It wraps it around. They've got very, very good smell. And they know what they're looking for. They smell what they're looking for. And they grab it with their trunk. There's a, just another vehicle behind there. Some, there's a lot of people driving in and out of the Masai Mara and the Triangle. You do have the opportunity to come up here and do it yourselves. And then it takes that grass and it sticks it in the mouth. So the trunk is very, very important for the elephant. You see how they're sucking up the mud. And they throw it on there. They also suck up water and then put it in their mouth as well. And they also breathe through that trunk. So the trunk is very, very important for the survival of these animals. And look how that baby is just loving the mud. Isn't that so cute? Oh, he's struggling to stand up now. <laughs> they're all very young, these babies. And they're covered in mud to help them keep cool. Because it is hot for them today. They're not used to being this hot. And uh, oh, look at that, falling in the mud. Oh, look at that one. There's a big one rolling in the mud. Now, there's only one other animal, apart from humans, I believe, that has fun with itself, and that is elephants. And look at that. Okay, well, we're going to stay with these elephants and their long trunks. We're going to go to Jamie, who's also got something long but slithery. I 
can't believe it, kids. This is so amazing. And I'll tell you why it's so amazing. It's because just a few moments ago, I was asked a question about whether there are lots of snakes in the grass. And we spoke about the fact that there are probably more of them in the rocky areas. Well, look at this. It's a massive black-necked spitting cobra. How cool is that? Now, I know lots of you will probably be quite scared of snakes. And that's okay. It's okay to be scared of snakes, but you don't need to be. What you need to do is respect snakes. So they don't mean us any harm. They're actually amazing animals. They really are. There are so many fascinating things about a snake. The, the trick is to know how to treat them and never to play with them unless it is a harmless snake that is somebody's pet. But you should never ever play with snakes or try to pick them up unless an adult says that it's okay. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can absolutely avoid being bitten because a snake is only going to bite you if it is afraid of you. So you don't want to make them afraid. Now this is one of the most venomous snakes that we get out here. Now what does venomous mean? Venomous means that if it bites you, you will get a very, very sick. If it bites you or it stings you. But poisonous is if you eat something and it makes you very sick. So that's an important difference. A snake is not poisonous. You could probably eat it if you really wanted to. Probably don't though. But a snake is venomous. And this is one of the most venomous snakes. But I'm not afraid because I know how snakes behave. Now watch the way that it moves. And just look how beautiful its scales are. Look how they shine in the sun. And look at the power of this snake's muscles. You can just, just see the hood in the front of its head. That's what gives or makes cobras famous. They've got a hood just behind the head that flares up if they're frightened. And this one can spit, so it can actually spit venom, which is why you always, if you're getting close to one of these, you want to make sure you've got some kind of glasses on. But a snake will always move away from you. See how the snake's not attacking us? We're right up close to us. It's not attacking us. It's just trying to move away. So it's not angry. I could, I could upset it if I were to try and get too much closer. But it's not angry. It's just trying to move away. That's awesome. Now, Caleb, you want to know why snakes go in the grass? Well, Caleb, for some of them, it's where their prey is. So a snake like this hunts mice and different types of rodents, and they eat seeds that are in the grass, so they have to go into the grass to look for prey. It's also, for some of them, where they are quite camouflaged, and most of them will have holes that they can hide in somewhere around here. Oh, this is so cool. I'm so excited. The snake must be over a meter and a half. Let's see, it is moving away from us, so I'm just gonna let it get a little bit further, and then we'll try and go a little bit closer. This is so cool, I'm so, so excited. Not many people get to see a snake like this. It's, list, it's lifting up its head to listen to the sound of the car, or to, to watch the car go past. Now, snakes are amazing. Snakes can basically taste smells in the air. So when you see a snake flickering its tongue, it's actually basically trying to smell. It's gathering up particles of smell and it is pulling it into its mouth. And it's basically its way of tasting a smell. And a snake is also very good at detecting movement. That's why if there's a snake that is really, really upset or frightened, the best thing is to stay still so that it doesn't think that you're attacking it. If you stay still, it will just start to move away. Now, Avery, you want to know how do snakes get so long? Well, some snakes don't. Some snakes stay short. But snakes like cobras and mumbas grow very, very quickly. And they're long because they have lots and lots of vertebrae. 
Do you know what vertebra are? Vertebra are the bones in your back. Now a snake has loads more vertebra than you do. Loads and loads more vertebra. As well as lots and 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 lots of ribs. Way more ribs than you have. And it all comes together to make the snake really long. And part of it is the head and the body and then part of it is the tail. And they're really narrow like that because their organs are all sort of made really nice and long. So they're not like us where we sort of, all of our organs sit in our tummy. Their tummies are really stretched out. Let's see if we can go around to get a better view. Just so that it doesn't disappear completely. I can't see where it went now. There it is. I'm hoping it's not going to go and hide in a hole. If we go, you know what, I think it might have a hole here. No, no, there it goes, there it goes. Okay, it's got a bit of a fright, let's just sit still. Now Logan wants to know why a snake stick their tongues out. So Logan, that's what I was explaining to you. A snake has got really, really sensitive cells on in, in its mouth. So a snake sticks out its tongue. Look how it's shining. That's not because it's wet. That's just because it's smooth. So a snake sticks out its tongue. It gathers up like the, 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 the particles in the air. So it almost sort of melts onto its tongue and then it pulls the tongue back into its mouth and it's got a very sensitive type of organ on the top of its palate. So if you put your tongue up against the top of your mouth, and a snake has got a very sensitive organ there that allows it to taste the smells that it's, it's picking up. So basically what that means is if you picture a smell like a color, this snake can smell where the mice have gone through, almost like a trail. It can see where the mouse was, and it can see where the mouse went, but it's through the smell. And that's why snakes flick their tongues. And the reason that they have a forked tongue is they can actually get the direction of a smell. And don't you think that might be useful in class when somebody lets something slip and pretends that they didn't? Well, snakes can actually detect where a smell came from, unlike human beings. Now that's why they have forked tongues. Ah, now Lilani, you want to know why don't snakes have legs? Well, it's one of the ways that they've evolved because they don't actually need them. Now kids, I'm just going to say that I'm not going to follow the snake. Okay, so once it goes, it's gone, unfortunately. Because if we follow it too much more, it's going to get really, really upset. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to make it scared or upset. So we're just going to let it disappear into the grass. So why don't snakes have legs? Some of the older snakes, like pythons and constrictors, they do actually have residual stumps near the back part of their tail where they used to have legs many, 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 many years ago. But it's, an, it's a way that they can move through being very energy efficient and they don't need legs because they've got these powerful muscles so that they can slide through the grass. It's a good question though. It's very hard to explain why a snake doesn't have doesn't have legs? It's a very good question. Now I'm going to show you something because our snake is disappearing and I'm going to show you. I said that I, let me just get it up quickly. I said that they have a hood. Now I want to show you what a hood looks like. So let me just in one second I will show you what the hood looks like. So Ava, what, sorry, Faith, what was the question from Ava? Ah, now Ava wants to know why do snakes hide? There we go, there's a picture of the cobra with its hood out. Snakes hide because they want to remain secret and hidden. They are 
most of them are ambush hunters. In other words, they grab their prey. They, that's what that snake looks like with its hood out. They sneak up on their prey and then they strike very quickly. So it's one way of hunting that means they don't have to chase whatever it is that they're hunting because they could never keep up with something like a mouse or even possibly a frog. There we go. Thank you. So, hiding away keeps them safe from other predators. There's lots of birds out here that like to eat snakes. So hiding away, or a mongoose, for example, might also want to eat a snake. So hiding away keeps them safe from predators, keeps them safe from humans, because they're scared of humans, and at the same time keeps them safe from birds as well. I'm so, so excited to have been able to show you that snake, and it was so perfect after the conversation we had about snakes in the grass. It was truly a perfect moment.